Well, welcome back, everybody. I haven't lost too many. Too many. Here we go. I got to admit somebody in here. Okay. Hope everyone had a good week. What I want to do is uh, I want to go and pull up, share with you the. Uh, oh, one second. Well, last minute. The calendar on Canvas to give an idea where we're at, just to make sure that everybody knows what's coming up, what's due, and so forth. Be no surprises. Uh, this is uh, the calendar does have that information for you. Uh, we have next week. Okay, next week will be the exam number two, which covers chapters four through six. Okay, and. Um, we also have next week on Friday the midterm for the lab online also. I'll get everything graded labs that you've done here this coming weekend so everything will be up to date as far as the grades. We will be doing chapter finishing up chapter seven today. After that, we'll get into chapter eight, which is uh, uh, nomenclature and the naming of the compounds, which by the way, if you recall, there is an assignment uh, called nomenclature, which has to do with the names. Okay. The lecture te test will be av available starting on Friday. And just like the last one, it starts on Friday and it ends on Saturday. Okay. Someone had a question. Now, the, the lab itself is just one day. So you have uh, the lab on Friday and then also available if you want it to start it would be the lecture exam. Okay. All righty, no problem. And so um, if you have any questions, don't forget, you're also invited to come to my Tuesday and Thursday class. In fact, we are on the same slide uh, chapter. In fact, we're just a little bit behind for the Friday class, but uh, Tuesday and Thursday, I start one at one o'clock and it goes to 2.15 and then one at 4.15 and it goes to 5.30. So you same link, you're more than welcome to stop by there, get a double, a double amount of, of chemistry if you like. Okay, um, if you don't have any other questions, what I want to do is continue with chapter seven, okay? And uh, get that out of the way. Fairly important chapter because it introduces a lot of concepts with respect to uh, polarity and nonpolar non bonds and polar bonds, and which, uh, which ties in to down the road to the next few chapters with respect to properties of compounds and how do we can identify those and compare and contrast them. All right, so <laughs> let me let me back it up a, a slide, but this is the slide we ended up. We've been talking about Lewis dot structures. Now, for the atoms themselves, it was fairly, straight, fairly straightforward. For the atoms themselves, we simply find what group they're in on the periodic table. And remember, this is only good for the ones in the, the A elements. So that's Roman numeral 1A to 8A. The B elements, unpredictable, depends on reaction conditions. We cannot predict how many valence electrons they have, but we can with the A elements. So from that information and where what group they're in, we can determine the Lewis dot structure, which is simply putting a dot next to the symbol that represents the number of valence electrons. So potassium, oxygen, silicon, magnesium, and iodine, Potassium's in group one, and we've got one dot. Oxygen's in group six, six dots. Silicon group four, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, pretty straightforward. That is the Lewis dot structures for the atoms. From there, we jumped into structures, Lewis dot structures for actual compounds, okay? And there's a procedure for that. What we do is we, we will always be told what the central atom is. Okay, that's going to be either in bold or underlined. 
nine times out of 10, the central atom is the first atom written in, in a formula. And that means that everything that follows is bonded to the central atom, okay? So we first tally up the total number of valence electrons that every atom brings to the structure, okay? And then, you know, we do that, we, we take the central atom, and since we're given what is bonded to the central atom, we can very quickly bond those atoms around the central, the ones that are bonded to the central atom, just quickly put them on there. So we could, for example, um, if we have, uh, let me let me just draw something here real quick. If we have something like uh, a a formula that says carbon, hydrogen, and three chlorides. Okay, and so we that tells us that carbon is a central atom. Okay, and that uh, the hydrogen and the chlorides are bonded to the central atom. So we can very quickly. Uh, write in the carbon and then draw four lines. Remember, each line represents a bond of two electrons. And then I can quickly do that. So that takes care of four bonds. Okay. Now, there's this up. Ooh. As we process the number of electrons, valence electrons that we have. Remember, hydrogen, its rule is two electrons. That is its, its octet rule, if you will. It's a duet rule. But that means that hydrogen, whenever you draw hydrogen, you will see hydrogen bonded one time. That's it. The, this bond right here, this line represents two electrons. It is being shared by both the hydrogen and X, whatever X may be, okay? So we can count those two electrons for the hydrogen. We can also count them for the X because they're being shared. And hydrogen cannot have any more electrons than two, that's it. So that means that hydrogen would always only have one bond to it, okay? All the other atoms that you're going to encounter will require eight electrons around it to fulfill the octet. So if we have a simple structure like, let's say, methane, this is the structure to methane, four hydrogens bonded around the carbon. Each line, one right there, right there, right there, and right there. Each one represents two electrons, and there's a total of four lines, which means there's eight electrons around the carbon, and that fulfills the, the octet for carbon, okay? The duet, obviously, for hydrogen has also been fulfilled. So that's a legitimate structure for that example that I just wrote. All right, so then we identify from the central atom the bonding pairs and the share uh, the lone pairs that we call. So the bonding pairs are shared electrons with another atom. And the lone pairs are electrons that are not bonded. Uh, a good example would be the structure for water. Water has, there's oxygen, two hydrogens. Then on oxygen, there are two electrons. Now you can draw two dots or you can draw a line. It makes no difference. I prefer a line, but I'm going to draw two, two dots there. Each dot represents an electron. There are four electrons around the central atom of oxygen. Those are unshared. Those are lone pair. That's what we call the lone pair. Okay. The bonding pair are those electrons that are that are being bonded with the hydrogen. So oxygen has two lone pairs in this example and two bonding pairs, but there's eight around oxygen, which fulfills the octet. Now, as you do number one, and you tally up the number of valence electrons, that is the number that you got to work with. So if you come up with eight valence electrons, 
due to all the atoms that are, are contributing to the structure, that is what you got to work with. You cannot just arbitrarily just add electrons if you need them. At the same time, if you got extra ones, you just can't take them out. You got eight to work with, you got to make them work. A lot of times they all come into play, there's not a problem. But there are times that when you when you get to the last step and you can't fulfill the octet because you don't have enough electrons, but someone, another atom does. And what you do, you start creating double bonds or triple bonds. That's the maximum. You got single bonds, double bonds, and triple bonds. You don't have anything like quadruple bonds. It's only single, double, and triple. And you start creating double bonds by sharing electrons from another atom, okay, to fulfill the octet. All right. <laughs> so we went through the example. Uh, oh, let me clear this. Of water. Okay. We tallied up the valence electrons. Oxygen, there's two oxygens. Each one brings on one valence electron, hence two times one. Oxygens in group six, six electrons. So we have a total of eight valence electrons, or uh, I like to make it divided, divisible by Q because the number you come up with should always be divisible by Q. And so we will end up with four pairs of electrons, okay? So we got eight valence electrons or four pairs. If your number that you come up with is not divisible by two, go check your math. Maybe you pulled the, pulled the wrong number of valence electrons, selected the, the wrong group, okay? But you should always have uh, a number divisible by two. So we got four pair, and the reason I like to use four pair is I can simply draw a line instead of hitting dots all the time. Because right now I've only got eight valence electrons, but there are some examples that you end up with 32 valence electrons. And so that's a lot of dots to kind of keep track of. So using the line kind of shortens the, the process and, and it's easier for me to keep to do my bookkeeping, okay? Because those eight valence electrons is what you got to work with. Okay? You can't arbitrarily add more. You can't arbitrarily just take them out. All right, so we end up with eight valence electrons. We know that oxygen, okay, uh, is given the formula that we have there. Like I said earlier, that nine times out of 10, uh, the atom, the central atom is written first. Now, you can see that that's not the case here for H2O. By convention, they write it as H2O, but oxygen is the central atom. Okay, so we can very quickly draw oxygen and then very quickly put two hydrogens bonded to the central atom, okay? And that takes care of two pair. I got two lines here. I got four pair to work with. I got to put those other two pairs someplace. I can't put them on the hydrogen because the hydrogen is full now, okay? So the only obvious place to put them is on the oxygen. And so now I got, I still got four pair. Yeah. Keep track of it. Keep track of my, my bookkeeping. I don't want to lose them along the way. I still got four pair of electrons. Okay. So that's good. There's eight around oxygen and uh, two around, um, um, two bonded around the uh, hydrogen. Okay. Now, from this point, now that I got the general formula that I want, I identified the bonding, what's bonded to the oxygen. I identified the lone pair. I can create a general formula of ABE format, okay? So that means that A represents oxygen. B represents whatever's bonded to the oxygen. And we got two of them, which is hydrogen. They don't have to be the same. They could be different. Okay, and we also got an E, which represents the number of lone pair on the central atom, which in this case, we have two lone pair of electrons on oxygen. So our general formula, okay, is AB2E2. Why do we need that general formula? Because we pull up the shapes table. 
And if you haven't done that yet and printed it out, then I strongly suggest you do because we use it quite a bit. And we look for AB2E2, which is right there. All right, sorry, there's a little noise outside. People are doing some landscaping. So we'll be over here in a second. So our general formula is given as follows, AB2E2, which we obtained from the structure that we came up with based on the valence electrons, created the general formula, which now tells us the geometry, the molecular geometry of the molecule. And so here you can see in the second column, you have the central atom, which is, which is oxygen, and then the two hydrogens bonded to oxygen. Also, you see that we have the two lone pairs on the central atom. Someone asked me about those, that kind of uh, oval shape. That doesn't mean anything, though that oval shape that you see right there, all that is is simply uh, kind of show you that's an orbital coming out of oxygen, okay? So there's two electrons sitting there and two pairs. That shape has a name, we call it bent. And it has a bond angle, and that is a bond angle between the, the hydrogens relative to the central atom of less than 109.4. Our pretty standard uh, bond or configuration is this one up here, the AB4. We call that tetrahedral. And okay, that's pretty common around the structures around in nature. And that's kind of like our reference point. And if you notice here that we have a central moiety with four things bonded around it. There's a bond, which I put an arrow to it, right? There's four bonds. Those four bonds contain two electrons, obviously, right? Those two electrons and each bond are negative charge. So what's going to happen is they're going to want to repel each other with maximum, put them in a position. So there's maximum repulsion. So that is the the position that comes up with with tetrahedral. That is the maximum amount of repulsion that all the electrons have with each other to give them a stable structure. And it's called tetrahedral. And that bond angle or reference bond angle is 109.4. Whenever you remove, say, one of these uh, bonded moieties, whatever it may be, here I'm putting the arrow to it, and I start adding lone pairs on the central atom, when lone pairs, non-bonded lone pairs, tend to occupy more space. And so an example here, these two electrons occupy more space. And the result is that bond angle is kind of pushed into, kind of crushed in. It's much less than we, what we would expect it to be. In this case, it's less than 120 degrees for that example. Okay. Oh, All right, so from the general formula that we obtained, okay, we know now the geometry and we know the name of the geometry and we know the bond angle, okay? And we end up with that structure right there. So that is the, the structure of water, very polar. Now, the other aspect about lone pairs on the central atom, we're going to be talking about this here pretty soon. But whenever you end up with a lone pair on the central atom, no question about it, you have what is called a polar molecule. We're going to be talking about polar and nonpolar, of which you're familiar with right now. Water is polar. Oil is nonpolar. Oil and water do not mix because of their properties. Okay, we all know that. Don't believe me to get a bottle of Italian dressing. Okay, you'll see. Two layers, an oil layer and an aqueous layer, water layer. And um, in order to use it, we mix it up, form an emulsion, and be able to put it in our salad. But if we let it set there, it separates. So water is very polar, oil is very nonpolar. And so when we determine the polarity of a molecule, then it helps us determine the properties of that molecule based on their polarity. But more on that here in a bit. All right, so we ended up here and we went through that scenario. We did HCN and we ended up with that structure. Okay, we ended up with five valence electrons. Okay, and in this scenario, we needed to create double bonds and eventually create triple bonds so that 
every atom is correct. Now, I need to pause this. I got a phone call that's very important. Take two seconds. Okay, I'll be right back. Okay, my apologies, I'm back. Okay, so anyway, we were talking about uh, coming up with the structure for HCN. First thing we did was add up the valence electrons. We ended up with 10 valence electrons or five pair. Uh, we, uh, carbon was the central atom. We bonded the hydrogen and, and the nitrogen to the central atom. And then we eventually created um, uh, double bonds and eventually triple bonds here because carbon uh, in our net scenario did not have uh, the optimum octet. And so to refresh memory, we ended up with a structure where we had carbon, I had bonded to that, and then had the hydrogen, and then the two remaining, the five. So I had five Valence electrons, okay? Carbon had four, hydrogen had one, and nitrogen brought in five, okay? So that's a total of 10 valence electrons or five pair. Uh, carbon is a central atom. I bonded the nitrogen, I bonded the hydrogen, and then I added the other three pair onto the nitrogen. Uh, hydrogen's happy, it's got a duet. Nitrogen is also happy, if you will, because there's eight electrons around it. However, carbon was shy for electrons. So what I did here was take a pair from nitrogen, two pair actually, and created a triple bond resulting in that formula, H, uh, uh, hydrogen bonded to carbon, a triple bond to nitrogen, and uh, an octet. Now you can notice that around nitrogen, and so when you check the octet, look at the atom, by itself. Nitrogen, I circled it, has around it eight electrons. Three, six of them are being shared with the carbon, but they also count toward the nitrogen. When I look at carbon, just look at carbon by itself, okay? And I can see that I have eight electrons around it. The octet is fulfilled. Again, six of them are being shared with the nitrogen and two of them are being shared with the hydrogen. And so we came up with that formula. Also, the general formula that we came up with was, was A, B, two. A, B, two being a general formula, which then takes you to the shapes table. A, B, two is the first entry. There is the geometry right there and the name of the shape and that bond angle between between the two moieties bonded to the central atom, which was 180 degrees, okay? So that's how the shape table comes into play. Uh, 
carbon. Uh, the next one was a, what we call a fluorinated hydrocarbon, trifluoromethane specifically is the next one. We add up all of the valence electrons. We ended up with this particular structure, which the general formula was uh, uh, AB4, which in the shapes table is tetrahedral. Okay. Carbon dioxide. Uh, again, we came, we went through this scenario and we came up with that structure. Like the first example, we needed to create double bonds on the carbon to fulfill the octet. So you can see that carbon has uh, two double bonds on each side for a total of eight electrons around it. And um, oxygen has two double bonds that are shared with the carbon, both oxygens, and then two lone pairs on the oxygen itself. The general formula here will be just like HCN, would be AB2, like the first example, which gave us um, um, linear uh, uh, geometry. And finally, at the end, we did uh, NH3, which is ammonia. This is the structure for ammonia, nitrogen bonded with three hydrogens around it. Now, when we do that, we end up with eight valence electrons, three coming from uh, hydrogens, five coming from nitrogen, gives total eight valence electrons and uh, or four pair, okay? Nitrogen's a central atom. We quickly bond. We can quickly bond nitrogen to the three hydrogens, okay? Which takes care of three pair. We got four pair to work with. We can't put it on the hydrogen. So the only place we can put them is on the nitrogen itself, okay? And so now the octet is fulfilled for everybody. We still have eight valence electrons that we calculated to begin with. Okay, the duet uh, is fulfilled for hydrogen. The general formula would be A, B, three, E, right? We have an E here because of the lone pair on the central atom, which is nitrogen. So the general formula is A, B, three, E, okay? We go to the shapes table. We look for the AB3E, which is right there. You can see here, it's called trigonal pyramid. We get the nitrogen in the center with its lone pair, okay? And then the three hydrogens represented by the, the other spheres. That bond angle is much less than 109.5 um, because again, the nitrogens, the lone pair occupy a lot of space and they crush in that bond angle, okay? All right, uh, let me see. Okay, we'll go back. So there's the formula. And so this, Procedure, write the valence electrons, identify the central atom, bond all the other atoms to the central atom, and that's take care, that takes care of, of, of a pair, and then start adding whatever remaining valence, remaining valence electrons you have around the atoms to the octet is fulfilled, uh, create double bonds and triple bonds as needed until the octet is, is fulfilled. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this takes care of neutral charged compounds. Okay. Notice there's no charge there. But we're going to start. Here's a, a, a summary of the uh, HCN that we did earlier. Okay. Some of that structure. Now, we're going to work with what are called polyatomic ions. Now, let me direct you again to the periodic table. On the periodic table on the far left corner, there is a table labeled most common polyatomic ions. These are ions. They are moieties that are bonded together as a unit and they have an overall charge to them. 
the majority of them are negative charged or anions. Okay, but there are some with a positive charge to it. And the rest of them are negative. So there's not too many cations. There's a lot of anions, okay? And these are polyatomic ions. They are units that we're going to be using quite a bit down the road here to make compounds, okay? And we have, uh, uh, like, we've got sulfur bonded to oxygen, nitrogen bonded to oxygen. We have either three oxygens or two oxygens. Okay, each with their own name. They have a very specific name. The NO3 negative is nitrate. And NO2 negative is called nitrite. Okay, not to be confused with... Uh, come on. Not to be confused with... Uh, sorry, it's N... Minus three, the ion nitride, okay? N-I-T-R-I-D-E, that's just a single nitrogen. When they put an oxygen next to it, like three oxygens, they call it's called nitrate, okay? If it's only two oxygens, it's called nitrite. Now, we're gonna be doing the Lewis dot structures for these polyatomic ions. And the procedure is the same. There's only one, two changes, two differences. One, notice the ions had a particular charge. We have to account for that charge. Now, we're not really truly, truly losing or gaining electrons. What we're doing is we're doing a bookkeeping of the electrons because there's reasons that why we add and why we subtract, but we're not really removing it, removing an electron or adding electrons. But if the ion is a negative charge ion, we have to add uh, the number of valence electrons we have to add to the, the, the final tally. And the number that we add depends on the charge. Notice that anion, some have had a negative one charge, some had a negative two charge, or some have a negative three charge. So we add that many electrons to our final tally at the end as far as counting up the valence. If it's positive, which we don't, we only have one cation ion, we subtract, okay? Because that, that valence electron, those electrons have been tied up to give this, the species, the ion, a positive charge. So we have to keep, charge, keep track of the bookkeeping. So we subtract the number, okay? Then what we do is we put a bracket, not a parenthesis, but we put a bracket around the whole structure and then the charge in the upper right-hand corner. We're gonna run, do a couple of examples here in a second, okay? Here, let's try the first one. The first cation that we did in the, in the bottom left corner of the periodic table was the NH4 plus. That was called the ammonium ion, okay? Now, we tally up the valence electrons like we normally do. We have nitrogen, it's in group five, and we have four hydrogens from group one. So we have a total of nine valence electrons. Now here's the, here's the thing here. If you forget, a lot of times you end up with the odd number, five and four. You check the, the group it's in and you come up and you say, yeah, I still got nine, what's the deal? Check to see what kind of ion you're dealing with. If you have a pad ion, then you need to subtract one from that tally. So now you have eight valence electrons, okay? And four pair. So that's what you got to work with. So you can very quickly, based on the structure you're given, because the nitrogen is the central atom, okay? And you have eight, four pair to work with. So I can very quickly draw nitrogen and four hydrogens bonded around it. Okay, and guess what? Right away, my four valence pairs are taken care of because it is a ion. I put a bracket, not a parenthesis, a bracket. 
and I put the plus charge in the upper right corner, okay? So now that is the structure I come up with. Now I can also create or determine the general formula, which is no different than before. So the general formula is A, B, four. A is the central atom nitrogen. B are the four hydrogens bonded around it. So if I look up AB4 in the shapes table, I get tetrahedral. So that ion has a tetrahedral structure, okay? And because it's an ion, then we put a bracket around it with a plus. And you should come up, let me clear my drawing. And that's what we come up with right there, okay? Now, just remember, it's a plus ion, so I subtract plus ion, subtract. Let me circle that. You subtract one for the charge. So if it's a plus two, subtract two, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. All right. Let's try a couple more. This time, let's work with the anions. Now, bromine is pretty special. Bromine can actually bond with uh, oxygens to form these particular ions. So this is bromine, and then around bromine, you have three oxygens, okay? Now, and it has a negative charge overall. Uh, do the same thing. Bromine brings in seven valence electrons. It's in group seven. There are three oxygens, okay? There are oxygens in group six, so it brings in 18 valence electrons. Then we get a negative one charge, so we're gonna add one more. So now we have a total of 26 uh, ele valence electrons to work with, or 13 pair, okay? If you forgot to add that one, you would end up with 25, which would be a flag for you. Okay, so I got an odd number here. It's not divisible by, by two, so we gotta go back and check. So we added one, so we end up with 13. The formula is given to you, it's under, uh, bromine is underlined, so that tells you that bromine is a central atom which means that you can very quickly uh, draw bromine as a central atom, okay? And then I have three oxygens bonded around it. So I can draw three oxygens, okay? So that took care of three pair, right? So I had, I had 13 pair to work with. I took care of three pair. So now I got 10 pair to work with. So now I can put them anywhere I want. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start in the outside of the atoms and atoms. So I got I got 10 to work with. I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Nope. Let me get that out of the way here. <laughs> What I got nine, right? So double check, make sure I get the same number. So I got nine around the oxygens plus the do the two the three that are bonded to the bromine. So I got a total of twelve pairs of electrons there. I have thirteen that I calculated. So I got to put the last one someplace. I can't put it on the oxygen. Why? because the oxygens all have eight around them already, but the bromine only has six. So the last one goes right on the bromine. Now I double check. I still have 13 pair, right? Double check, I always keep track of it. I got 13 pair is what I calculated. And now uh, check my octet, the oxygens, all the oxygens are happy. I got three lone pair and one bonded pairs, so all three oxygens are, have the octet and bromine has the octet. Now, once that's done, I can simply put the bracket around it, okay, with the negative charge and I'm done. And let me uh, clear that and get a clearer picture other than mine. There it is, okay. Now, I can still, 
at this point, determine like I did with the neutral atoms, the general formula. And so here I got A, B, 3, E. That is the general formula for this ion. So going to back to the shapes table, A, B, 3, E. Uh, 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 hold on one second. Yeah, let me get the shapes table. AB, AB3E, its shape is like the ammonia we did earlier. It has trigonal pyramid as the name. There's a lone pair in the central atom and bond angle less than 109.5. Okay. And that is the geometry for that ion. Okay. Now, the next one, SO4, that's one of the polyatomic ions in the table. It's called the sulfate ion, okay? Now we, we do what we do before and nothing different. Just keeping them, making aware that it is an ion with a negative two charge, which means we're gonna end up adding a negative two, okay? So sulfur brings in six valence electrons. Oxygen, there are four oxygens each bring in six valence electrons so I have a total of 24 okay and then uh because of the two charge we add two, two electrons so we have a total of 32 electrons okay or 16 pair sulfur is is the central atom so i can do sulfur very quickly and then bond four oxygens around it because that's the structure I've been given okay and that takes care of four pair which means I got 12 to go right I got 16 to begin with subtract four I got 12 to work with now I cannot put it anymore in the sulfur you notice that because there's eight around it already so the only other place they can go would be on the oxygen. So I count them. I got four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, which is what I calculated. So I got 16 pairs of valence electrons, which is consistent with what I calculated. Okay, this is a ion. So I put a bracket and a negative two charge in the top right corner. Okay, and that is the structure I've come up with. All right, now the general formula, no different than before. This general formula for the sulfate ion is AB4. Yeah, there's four oxygens around it. A, B, four, no lone pair on the central atom. They're all bonded, bonded pair. All the lone pairs are on the oxygen. I think to remember about the general formula, A, B, E. E is the lone pairs on the central atom only. We don't care about the other uh, compounds and the other uh, atoms, whether they got a lone pair or not. They don't count as far as the ABE general formula to determine the shape. Okay, here we got HCN. This is called the cyanide ion. It's on the polyatomic uh, ion list, okay? Got a negative charge. You can tell it right away, it's only two, two atoms, a carbon and a nitrogen. That means that that's gonna have, it's gonna be linear, okay? Because there's no really no central atom. They're just two of them bonded together. So we get a lin linear geometry. Well, we do the same thing, okay? We uh, carbon brings in four, okay? Nitrogen brings in five valence electrons, and then we get a negative charge. So we add one electron, okay? So we have a total of 10 electrons. So at this point, or five pair. So at this point, we can um, very quickly just draw carbon, Bonded to nitrogen, that takes care of one pair. So I got four pair to work with, and I can put them in where I want. I got one, two, three, and then add the other one on carbon. So I still have five pair altogether. 
The nitrogen has uh, eight around it. Carbon only has uh, two pair around it. And so like we did the HCN, we're gonna do the same thing here. We're gonna create a triple bond, okay? Resulting in that structure. And don't forget the bracket with the negative one charge, all right? All right, so um, you might think, okay, that you might be thinking, all right, well, I, I don't understand why we're we're adding here. This, this would explain right here. Remember we did the, um, let me draw this. The earlier one, we did the H, C, N, hydrogen cyanide, okay? Also with five valence electrons, like we're doing this, the, the ion here. Well, the, re, the way we made the ion is we took off that proton, okay? The hydrogen on the HCN. Well, we, we took it off completely, but that pair of electrons still remain there. See the arrow? That pair still remains there. It's, it's now double lines right there. So, in the north, so the electrons didn't really go. The fact that the hydrogen disappeared because we're working with with the ion means that we have to account for that lone pair. We don't have a hydrogen there to put in there in the valence electrons like we like we did when we did HCN. We had the cyanide, so that is why we're adding one to one electron. We're not really adding more electrons. It's already there. Okay, we just it's a bookkeeping thing. Same is true for all the other anions, okay? Because all the other anions had a, a hydrogen bonded to them and they were removed. Okay. Any questions so far? No. Which I, well, I kind of introduced this part of it. It's called the, it's got an issue, it's an acronym, B-S-E-P-R called valence shell electron pair repulsion. Simply put is that electrons obviously having a negative charge and uh, they repel each other. That repulsion has an effect on the geometry of the molecule, okay? And uh, this is what this is all talking about. We've been talking about the molecular shape. I introduced that to you using the shape table. All right, so we also talked about the general formula so we can determine the geometry where A represents a central atom, B represents the anything bonded to the central atom. It, it, we, it doesn't have to be the same atom, it could be different atoms. And then E represents the lone pair only on the central atom, not the lone pair on, on other things. It doesn't, doesn't, uh, we don't, as far as the shape is concerned, that has no effect on the overall shape, just on the central atom. All right, so uh, all the diatomics have no fear of ice cold beverage. Remember those hydrogen, oxygen, chlorine, etc. They're they're linear. They gotta be. And when you got two species attached to them, okay. And so you have the model here, the structure in the left hand side, and then the green on the right hand side, you have a three dimensional model that represents here two chloride atoms, okay? Uh, carbon dioxide, okay? Uh, that also is linear, the AB2 uh, structure. We have carbon in the center represented by the, the black sphere, and then the red represents, is repre uh, represents the oxygen. Linear species, there's a double bond. Very crucial, this double bond, because this geometry has a big, big effect on what we're gonna be talking about down the road here about polarity and being polar and non-polar, okay? Um, another geometry called the AB3, it's trigonal planar. A good, good example would be here's a formula of uh, formaldehyde. This is the formula of formaldehyde, carbon, two hydrogens, and then a double bonded oxygen. That bond angle all the way around is 120 degrees. Okay, and then the most common structure that we see out there is called tetrahedral, AB4. Here's a, a model, three-dimensional model. The carbon is represented by the black sphere and then the white 
is, uh, is the hydrogen. This is um, methane, for example, right? one single carbon and four hydrogens bonded around it. Three-dimensionally, you can see that how, how it is all around, you know, because we live in a three-dimensional world. Unfortunately, the pictures we show you here, sometimes it's two, it is two-dimensional, but we got to remember we live in a three-dimensional world. Yeah, here's one. This is SO2. You would think, for example, that SO2, like carbon dioxide, CO2, who have similar structure, okay? Uh, carbon dioxide is linear linear, but SO2 is not, it's called bent. And the reason is because sulfur is in a different group and it's got an extra pair of electrons bring into the table. And so that pair has to be someplace. And yes, you had a question about the model, go ahead. The question is why doesn't it Triple bond on both sides. Okay, let's go back. The question is, if you make a triple bond, which would be a structure, it's a good question. Let me let me let me show you what it would look like, and correct me if this is what you're thinking. All right, and so the question is, why couldn't I get Carbon, one, two, three, oxygen, double bond, one, two, three, oxygen, there. Okay, is that what you, you had in mind? Yes, okay. Let me ask you a question. How many electrons do you see around carbon in this model? The one I just drew. How many, how many electrons are counting there? Ah, wow, okay. Would that, what rule would that violate? Okay, the octet, okay. Remember the driving force when we were talking about ions was to have eight valence electrons around the outermost shell. And that is also true when we start making compounds, okay? The nonmetals gain electrons and now had eight valence electrons on their outermost shell. Fluoride, for example, has seven valence electrons. So it wants to pick up one electron to get the octet fulfilled. Sodium had 11 electrons, okay? One of them is in the outermost shell. By losing that one electron, now the next shell in is full with eight. Now it has 10. Eight of them is in the second energy level, okay, full. So here's the same thing. If you count, just look at carbon, just look at carbon and forget the oxygens for right now. How many lines do you see around carbon? How many pair are there around carbon right now? Four, or how many, or pair, or eight electrons, correct? Okay. Yes, so the octet for carbon is fulfilled. Now, take oxygen, just one of them, and count how many electrons around oxygen. Also eight. So in that case, the octet is fulfilled. If we use this model here, we have 12 valence, 12 electrons around carbon, which violates the octet rule, okay? And that's why you can't have triple bonds around the carbon, because there's a violation of octet. Again, the driving force, and the only exception is hydrogen. Hydrogen has a duet rule because hydrogen begin, has room for one more electron. Has hydrogen is 1s1. Okay, by picking up one electron, it fills that s orbital. And so hydrogen, no matter where you see it, and I drew the x because x could be whatever it's bonded to, hydrogen will 
always have just one bond because it has the duet rule. Its rule is duet. Everybody else has the octet rule. Okay. Does that explain it for you, Christine? Okay. Any, uh, any other questions? So that's the thing. When you draw these structures, remember, look at the octet. Everything we've driven here, even look at chlorine. Okay. Chlorine has eight around each one. Three of them are non are uh, lone pair, and one of them is shared. Okay, if we look at um, carbon, we just went through that. Look at this one. Hydrogen has this duet. Okay, hydrogen has. Looking at hydrogen, we got that lone pair right there. Oh, it's supposed to be an arrow. <laughs> Okay. Right there. That lone pair is two electrons, which fulfills the hydrogen's duet rule. If we look at carbon itself, we got a double bond that has four electrons and two single bonds, which has a total four. So there's eight electrons around carbon. And then if you look at hydrogen, oxygen, excuse me, also you have eight electrons around the oxygen. Four of them are shared with carbon, okay? Remember that even though they're bonded to another atom, those, these are covalent bonds. So they're being shared with each other. They're gonna be unequal sharing, but they're being shared nevertheless. And so they could be counted towards each atom individually, okay? I hope I hope that answered your question there. Uh, same scenario here. We got methane. We got four pair around carbon, a total of eight electrons, and then only one pair around each hydrogen, which is a duet. And that's the tetrahedral. Then we have the bent. Again, same scenario. When they when they bond are there electrons no 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 the bonds are being shared these are covalent bonds nothing's being lost what is happening don't confuse the ionic compounds ionic bonds with the covalent when you have sodium metal and chlorine they come together to form sodium chloride the sodium gives up a full electron and gives it to the chloride okay and that causes an octet. We have one slide where we have that reaction. We have sodium and chloride coming together to form the salt, sodium chloride. They have a full charge. There's a full exchange of electrons. With covalent bonds, the covalent bonds, electrons are not lost. They are shared. That's the whole point of covalent bonds. That line right there, has two electrons, that arrow where I'm pointing to, that has two electrons. And those two electrons are being shared by the sulfur and the oxygen. This line right here has a double bond, two lines, has a double bond. Those four electrons, every line represents two electrons. Every line, that double bond is being shared with the sulfur and the oxygen, okay? And the fact that they can be shared, they can be counted toward both the oxygen and the uh, sulfur individually. And so what I was trying to show you here is that if you look at simply the sulfur itself, okay, and I'm circling the sulfur, there are a single bond around it and a double bond around it and a lone pair. That is a total of eight electrons, which fulfills the octet, okay? Six of them are being shared with other atoms. They're being shared with the oxygen. One is a single bond, one is a double bond. 
And one is on itself, a lone pair is not being shared with nobody, it's simply on the oxygen itself, on the sulfur itself. If you look at oxygen right here, I circled oxygen, you'll see there are eight electrons around it. Again, the eight, the valence shell, the, the octet has been fulfilled. Of those eight, six of them are lone pair. They're not being shared with nobody. But one, two of them are being shared with the sulfur. Okay. Okay. If that works for you, exactly. They are, you know, if you want uh, whole dependent, because, but they are dependent on each other because they're being shared. They're not, they're not wholly not shared. For example, if we look at a molecule of ionic compound of sodium chloride, okay, that is because we had come together with a sodium ion and the chloride ion. Okay. Now, sodium had one valence electron. It lost it, gave it to the chloride atom. Chloride has seven valence electrons. It picked up that one. And by picking up an electron, now it has a full negative charge. The ionic bonds come together like two magnets. That's how they attract each other. There is no bond between them. Okay, that's where you got it. You have to understand the difference. Ionic bonds do not have a true bond. They call it a bond. It should be ionic attraction, technically. That is what's really happening. It's like two magnets coming together. Covalent bonds, they co-share those valence electrons. Okay, sometimes they share them equally. Sometimes they share them not equally. And that's dependent on the electronegativity, which we're going to talk about here in the bit. Okay. So covalent, they're sharing. If you want to call it codependent, that's yes. <laughs> Whatever works. Okay. Now the difference here now, remember, is an ionic on. When I take an ionic compound and I put it in water, guess what happens? Like two magnet magnets, you they separate into the ions. A covalent bond doesn't do that, okay? I put in sulfur dioxide in water, it stays SO2. There are no ions being formed. There is only one exception, and that is when we're dealing with acids, like hydrochloric acid, the same acid that you have in your stomach. That is a covalent compound. But because of the nature of the acidity, it will, feel okay? it will dissociate, but we're gonna to get to that. And for right now, covalent compounds do not dissociate. All right, hopefully that helped. Um, where are we at? All right, so what, what we were talking about is the different structures. Now here's another one, the AB3E trigonal pyramid. Ammonia is very classic. It has a, you end up with a lone pair on the central atom. The thing to remember when you use the Lewis dot structures and you come up with a structure with a lone pair, the next question that might be asked, is it a polar molecule? By default, the answer is yes. Okay? You always end up with a polar molecule when you have a lone pair in the central atom. Okay, so here's a three-dimensional model here. The blue is the nitrogen and the white is the hydrogens. And then there's a lone pair on the central atom. Uh, water, classic example of an AB2E2, two lone pairs, extremely polar, extremely polar molecule. Two lone pairs in there. Excuse me. <laughs> All right. So, uh, given any covalent molecule or a poly polyatomic ion, hopefully you should be able to draw the Lewis dot structure. Okay. And don't forget, if you're dealing with a polyatomic ion, not, don't forget to put the bracket and the charge in the upper right corner. 
uh, draw the electron dot structure and determine the shape and the bond angle, okay? Just like we've been doing. So a couple of things for you to try and see if you can next time we meet next week, there's a question about it. Try pH3, see what kind of structure you come up with and then try ozone. Ozone has the formula, there's three oxygens bonded to it. It's O3. That is the, the, the formula for uh, ozone. Uh, there's two types of two types of ozone out here. We got the, the 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 bad ozone that we breathe in because of the quality of the air around us. Not the best thing because ozone itself is, is is very reactive. And then we got the ozone that is the good ozone that's up in the atmosphere. It's a very thin layer. What that does is protects us from the uh, UV light of the sun. And unfortunately, that ozone layer has a big hole in it. And it's due to these hydrocarbons, that uh, floral hydrocarbons that were up in the air, they tend to react with the light and then react to the ozone. So anyway, you may notice if you, uh, if you, if you look at the history of, of a skin uh, suntan lotion, you'll find the number has increased quite a bit in the last 20 years. You need any more protection because of the excess UV light coming at you. Anyway, so try the PF3, try the ozone. Uh, we, we can uh, bring it bring it back uh, next week and we can talk about it if you don't if you didn't figure it out. okay? All right, which brings us to an important part about this whole thing. It's called bond polarity, okay? Now, as I stated, covalent bonds are where is a bond, a true bond where electrons are shared. Now, there's two types of sharing. There's equal sharing and not equal sharing. When there are equal sharing, okay, we call that a non-polar covalent bond, okay? Now think of it, maybe it is an analogy as a tug of war between two people of same weight. Um, got 200, two 200 pound people pulling on the rope. That rope represents that bond between the two. So being equally weighted, equally strength, there's an equal sharing on that rope and so the rope doesn't go anywhere. Now, that is a non-polar bond. The thing to remember about this is you will find this to be the case when the two atoms are the same, okay? When the two atoms are the same, you have a non-polar bond. When you the two atoms are not the same, you have what we call a polar bond, okay? And, the, and so there becomes an unequal sharing. Now, why do we have an unequal sharing? Because a while back, not too far back, we talked about a property of the atoms called electronegativity. Not ionization energy, but e EN, electronegativity. That was a measure of the affinity for an atom to pull electrons, to attract electrons in a bond. Okay, and fluorine was the most electronegative element that there is. So if, if fluorine was covalently bonded to anything, it would cause those that electrons to be pulled onto itself, much more so than the other atom. Does not break it apart, it just pulls it. The result is you actually have a polar bond. And what do we mean by polar bond? Well, think about this for a second. Um, if you take a balloon, and I may have used this analogy before, if you take a balloon, you rub it on your head, okay, for a little bit, and then you place it on your chest. Do you not get that balloon to stick on your chest for a bit? Okay, you do. And what's happening here is this. As you rub that balloon on your head, you're, we are loaded and covered with electrons all around us. If you don't believe me, walk on a carpet, drag your feet in a carpet and then touch a piece of metal. See what happens. You get a zip, those are electrons, okay? Uh, you wake up in the morning with a bad hair day, it's all 
crazy? Those are electrons up there. They're repelling each other. And so by rubbing your head on that balloon, you transfer those elect some of those electrons onto the surface of the balloon, now have a charge and negative field on the balloon. As you bring that balloon onto the surface of your chest, there are electrons on your chest. They're negative charge. The balloons have a negative charge. They repel each other, okay? As the balloon gets closer, those electrons on your surface get repelled and go deeper into you, leaving behind a partial positive area or nature on your chest. The, the, the balloon has a negative nature to it. Your surface of your chest has a positive nature to it. Positive and negative attract, guess what? Boom, the balloon sticks to you, okay? Won't stick there forever. Eventually, it gets, goes back to stable state and the balloon falls off. But for that brief moment of time, you have created a dipole. There's a dipole like a magnet. We got a North Pole and a South Pole. The battery that you have in your electronic device right now is a, has a dipole. You got a positive and a negative side, okay? Because of the electronegativity of the atoms in the bonded covalent bond, because of differences in the electronegativity, you create a dipole. So you create a partial positive side and a partial negative side, which has a big effect on the properties of that compound. Okay, now let me add this to this. There's two things. In the general formula, I'm going to say when A is bonded to A, when the elements are the same. So that means you know seven examples of a nonpolar bond already. Have no fear of ice cold beverage. All of those diatomic atoms are that bond is a nonpolar bond. Okay. So all diatomic. And I'm going to add one more. And all carbon hydrogen bonds are nonpolar bonds. Okay. Even though carbon and hydrogen are different atoms, their electronegativity is essentially the same and it's net negligible. And so they're essentially. They're the same element, okay? So all your diatomic elements and any carbon-hydrogen bond are nonpolar bonds. What that means now that anything, A is a general element and B is a general element. Any covalent bond with two different elements, regardless of what they are, except carbon-hydrogen, is a polar bond. Okay, that, that simple. Nothing more complicated. Okay, nothing more. And that's how you determine. So two things. Let me back up and retract for a second. Two types of bonds, ionic bond, covalent bond. How do we determine an, an ionic bond? That's a combination of a metal and a non-metal. In that scenario, they have a full-fledged positive and a full-fledged negative charge the ions do, and that's how they attract to each other, okay? There's a full loss and gain of electrons. In a covalent bond, okay, this is the combination of a non-metal and a non-metal. So any combination of non-metals is a covalent bond. Within the covalent bond, you have either equal sharing or unequal sharing. If the two elements are the same, or the carbon hydrogen, then you have a nonpolar bond. That bond is, those electrons in that bond are equally shared, okay? Two 200 pounders pulling on that rope. If one, if the two atoms are different, then you have unequal sharing. So you have a 200 pounder and a 400 pounder pulling on that rope. Obviously the 400 pounder is gonna pull a little bit more. The result is that you created a dipole, has two poles. You have a negative side and a positive side, not a full-fledged negative like the ionic, 
but what we call a partial negative side and a partial positive side. Okay. That's the main difference here. This, this is the subset, if you will, of the covalent compounds. All right, let me clear this up a little bit. Um, okay, so back to electronegativity. Okay, and just to refresh your memory, the ability of a bonded atom to attract electrons in the bond in a bond toward itself. Fluoride is the most el electronegative element. Okay, and so we look at fluorine as our benchmark when we want to compare other bonded elements, which ones are more electronegative, because that determines which direction those electrons are being pulled, okay? We know that noble gases are not gonna bond, so they don't have any electronegativity. So remember that for chem 130, noble gases don't bond, zero electronegativity, okay? Our, our general trend, we had this, this uh, trend last, uh, before, but to refresh your memory, we got fluoride sitting up there in the right-hand corner. So that's our benchmark. So we can use that as our reference point to determine who's more electronegative when we are looking at other combination of atoms. And whoever's closer to fluorine, it has the greater electronegativity. Yes, every atom has their own electronegative negative value, and you can welcome to look that up and so forth. Or you can just use the general trend that we that there is with respect to electronegativity using the periodic table. Okay. So as I mentioned earlier, all the poly all the diatomic atoms are nonpolar. They have that bond between them is shared equally. Okay. And also included in there is a carbon hydrogen bond. It's considered to be nonpolar because the electronegativity of carbon and hydrogen is essentially the same. Okay. All right. Now, when it comes to polar covalent bonds, they have a combination of two different nonmetals. And one of them is going to hold on to the electrons a little bit tighter. It's not going to take them away. There's going to be no electron loss. They're just going to pull those electrons a little bit tighter onto itself. Okay. So, examples of polar bonds are here carbon and oxygen, two different atoms. Okay. Hydrogen and chloride, two different atoms, polar covalent bonds. All of them are non metals. So, all of them are covalent bonds. But the fact that they're different, they're polar. Sulfur and fluoride, polar. Silicon and nitrogen, again, polar covalent bonds. All of those are examples of polar covalent bonds, okay? Now, as I mentioned, because of the electronegativity, the difference in the electronegativity, one of them will pull the electrons onto themselves much stronger than the other one. And so we create what is created is what is called a partial positive atom and a partial negative. And we designate that by using the symbol, which is the Greek symbol delta. Okay, the lowercase delta. That means partially positive and then partially negative. All right. We also use an arrow to represent what direction the dipole is being uh, pulled to. The arrow points to the most electronegative elements, as I can, you see here uh, with the bond here with carbon and fluoride. Fluoride is a lot more electronegative than carbon, okay? Fluoride is the most electronegative element there. And so, it pulls the electron density onto itself more so than carbon does, resulting in a partial negative area around the fluoride. 
because of that, just like that scenario with respect to the balloon, what's happened to the carbon, it has been stripped of electron density, resulting in a more partial positive area. So the carbon has the partial positive side and the fluoride has the partial negative side. And we designate it with the, with the delta, lowercase delta symbol as follows. Then we also use the arrow uh, with the little plus sign on the, on, the, on the left here, on the left side of the arrow. The arrow itself points to the most electronegative and then the, the dipole arrow, arrow uh, has a positive end to it, a little line. Now, these arrows, okay, here's, here's an important part about these arrows. These arrows represent what are called vectors. Now, we're not gonna get into details of mathematics, but it simply put as this. I can say, uh, I can give you a distance, like for example, 50 miles, which doesn't really mean anything. Okay, I just have a magnitude of 50 miles. But if I put a direction with it, if I say 50 miles north, then I have what's called a vector, okay? It has magnitude and it has direction. Now, the, uh, the other aspect of this is that that arrow, that dipole arrow is a mathematical representation of that vector. And so if that arrow length, which represents the magnitude, if they coincide with each other, for example, let's say I got one arrow going this direction, same length, and I got another arrow going same length, in the same direction. Mathematically, I can add those two values together, okay? Because of go, they're, they're, they're additive. However, if I got one arrow going to the left, maybe in the negative direction, okay? And the other arrow going exactly to the right in the positive direction, guess what? Those two arrows cancel each other out. And that's important to know because we're gonna use that property to determine whether a molecule is polar or nonpolar. Right now we're dealing with just the bond, the bond itself. But then cumulatively, we're gonna look at all the bonds of a molecule and determine what is the overall nature of the molecule. And if a molecule has polar bonds in general, you end up with a polar molecule. But if any of the bonds cancel each other out, guess what? You end up with a non-polar molecule, okay? And we use the arrows to help us determine whether these polar bonds cancel each other out. Keeping in mind that we, we, these arrows represent vectors that we can add and subtract graphically, okay? And here I got one going to the left, one going to the right, but the same token, it can, they can go in this direction toward each other, the arrows, that also will cancel each other out. Whether the arrows are pointed in opposite directions or they're coming together. They, those two, the net effect will be zero, okay? So that's important. So in the next example, we got oxygen and hydrogen, polar bond, two different atoms, right? Now, we draw the arrow going from right to left. Why? Because oxygen has a higher electronegativity, okay? How do we know that? Look at its position in the periodic table. Oxygen is literally right next to fluoride. Hydrogen is on the far left. And so oxygen is a lot more electronegative. So if there's a bond between the hydrogen and the oxygen, the oxygen will pull the electron density onto itself more so than the hydrogen, resulting in a partial negative area for the oxygen and a partial positive for the hydrogen. In this case, this, the arrow, the dipole arrow goes from right to left. If we look at a bond between phosphorus and chloride, okay, to, to determine whether it's a polar bond? Yes, it's a polar bond. Why? Because there's two different atoms, plain and simple. Now, which, which direction does the polarity go with this? That is where we bring in electronegativity. Which one's more electronegative? Well, we find its position relative to fluorine. And fluoride is right below fluoride. 
phosphorus is like two, three groups to the left, further away. So chloride is a lot more electronegative, which tells you that it pulls the electron onto themselves more so than phosphorus, resulting in a partial negative on the chloride and a partial positive on the phosphorus. And the arrow here goes from left to right, okay? This polarity is very crucial in chemistry. It is because of this polarity that we are able to make new compounds. We look for groups in that compound that have a polar bond that allows us to uh, do something to change the compound, okay? Now, I hope you can see here, guess what? These are like little magnets, if you will. And like little magnets do, if I were to get a handful of magnets, wouldn't they line up, right? You know, depending on the North and South Pole, well, these, these are very similar. These would line up because of the positive side and the negative side. So if I had another molecule of phosphorus and chloride, it would line up with phosphorus and chloride because the negative side will attract the positive side of the next molecule. That results, and that could be a very strong interaction, and that results on what we call um, intermolecular forces and why certain things boil at certain temperatures and other things boil at, say, lower temperatures because of that interaction uh, that molecules have with each other, okay, which is related to the polarity of the molecule, which is related to the polarity of the chemical bonds in the molecule. Okay, and let's see. All right, so we use that nomen that the um, um, the delta notation, and we use the polar bond to denote which direction the polar bonds. We talked about noble gases at length that are just have no electronegativity. Their octet is full. That is the driving force, eight, okay? If, and, and it goes back to the question we had earlier, when you're writing the structures, you know, anything greater than eight is incorrect. Anything less than eight is incorrect, okay? So you gotta strive for the eight, except for hydrogen that has two, okay? and. That's pretty self-explanatory here about fluoride. Fluoride is the most, it's an electron hog, if you will. Okay, so here they're asking you to add the notation, the delta notation, and the polarity arrow for these bonds. So we have carbon and oxygen, okay? Automatically, all of these we can see we have polar bonds except for one, and we'll get to that here in a second. So carbon, oxygen, different atoms, polar bonds. That's a given. Question now is which direction does, does the polar bond go to? So to answer that, we look at the electronegativity between the carbon and the oxygen, and we use the periodic table, and we know that based on the periodic table, oxygen is closer to fluorine than carbon. Therefore, oxygen is a lot more electronegative. Therefore, the arrow will go from left to right with delta negative on the oxygen, delta positive on the carbon. Uh, nitrogen and fluoride, you don't even have to look this up because we know fluoride has the, the most electronegative. So it automatically going from left to right here, partial negative on the fluoride. Hydrogen and oxygen and hydrogen, we did this earlier. Hydrogen is a lot more electronegative. So in this scenario, the arrow is going from right to left. If it was written hydrogen bond uh, oxygen, then the arrow goes from left to right, okay? Same, the same thing. Partial, delta, uh, partial negative on the oxygen, partial positive on the hydrogen. Um, chloride and carbon, we're going from right to left, okay? And then hydrogen and carbon. You might think, okay, different atoms, it's polar, right? Wrong. Remember, the electronegativity of hydrogen and carbon is essentially the same. So this will have no arrow, okay? Because it is a nonpolar bond. 
and nonpolar bonds would not have an, an arrow. All right, <clears throat> so in this question, it asks you, are these bonds ionic, okay? Or, and if they're not, they must be covalent. So identify the polar covalent and identify the nonpolar covalent. So look at the first question. Are these bonds ionic? You recall what the criteria is for an ionic bond? Okay. Criteria for an ionic bond, an ionic bond. You gotta have metal and a non-metal. Do we have any non-metal and metal combinations here? Yes. The sodium chloride is a ionic bond. Okay, right there. That is the only ionic bond. And so it has nothing to do with covalent. So it's by default, it's already a polar species, the fact that it's ionic. Okay. That means the other ones are all covalent compounds. The first, excuse me, the first one is a bromine bromine bond. Okay. It's a covalent compound, but they're both the same. So that means that is a nonpolar bond. Okay. The second one, the phosphorus and the fluoride, two different elements, polar bond automatically. And then the far right, fluoride and bromide bond, two different elements, polar covalent, okay? And so the first example is a nonpolar. And then the phosphorus um, fluoride is a polar bond. The sodium chloride is an ionic bond. And then the last one is a polar bond. And remember, right now, we're just simply talking about the bonds themselves, identifying what type of bond it is, okay? Because once we identify that, we're going to apply that, apply the geometry to determine the overall polarity of the molecule. Okay. So let me erase this real quick. So polarity is going to be a factor. It's going to come in time and time and time again. So we really got to grab a hold of the concept and just think of it as a, just a tug of war between the bonded elements. It's a tug of war. We're not going to strip the electrons. Nobody is losing the electrons. They're going to be shared and either they're going to be equal sharing in this tug of war or they're going to be unequal sharing. Okay. And, and uh, depending on the electronegativity of the element that's involved in the bond, if it's more electronegative, it's going to be the unequal sharing that's going to go in that direction. All right. So, uh, so you might be able to answer these questions real quick because they say, okay, what's well, sodium chloride? It's very similar to what we just, we just did. Is it ionic, polar, nonpolar? Well, sodium chloride, don't have to go any further. You got sodium and chloride, definitely an ionic compound. That's it. Okay, you don't have to go any further. It's a metal and a nonmetal. If you forget what the metal is, what which elements are metals, remember the stair step of the periodic table. To the left are the metals, to the right are the nonmetals, with the exception of hydrogen, which is in the far left. That is a non-metal. It just happens to be in group 1A because it has one valence electron like, like the other elements in group 1A. All right, hydrochloric acid, we have uh, HCl, I should say, two non-metals, okay? So we have a polar covalent bond because that bond is between two different non-metals. So it's polar covalent. In fact, Earlier, I said this, all the ionic compounds, when we put them in water, they will dissociate completely, okay? Some dissociate completely, some dissociate a certain percentage, but they will dissociate to form the full-fledged positive and the full-fledged negative ion, okay? With covalent compounds, they don't do that. All the other covalent compounds that we talk about, they stay intact when we put them in water, with one exception. And those are acids. We have a whole chapter in acids. And this 
here, HCL is the acid that is roaming around in your stomach right now, hydrochloric acid. We have other examples. If you drink a lot of soda pop, there's phosphoric acid, uh, there's uh, sulfuric acid. Those are examples of covalent compounds that dissociate, but we, we'll get more on that. Okay, but for right now, covalent compound doesn't dissociate. Okay, H, H and H, which is basically hydrogen, diatomic hydrogen, nonpolar covalent, carbon and chloride, two different atoms. Okay, both nonmetals, covalent, two different atoms, polar. Okay, carbon and hydrogen, covalent. But remember, carbon and hydrogen, electronegativity, both the same, so they're nonpolar. Oxygen and oxygen, okay? Two uh, nonmetals, covalent, two same nonmetals, nonpolar. And we've got potassium and oxygen, that adds, creates uh, an ionic compound, okay? And then we have phosphorus and um, Chloride, two nonmetals, two different metals, polar covalent. Okay. Now, with respect to the covalent bonds, we can draw the arrows very quickly. Hydrochloric, which it goes from left to right, okay? Because chloride is a lot more electronegative than hydrogen. And so it goes from left to right, leaving a partial negative on the chloride side. The carbon and the chloride. Chloride, again, is a lot more electronegative. So in this case, the dipole arrow goes from right to left, okay? Because the way it's written, leaving a partial negative on the chloride. Uh, and then finally, the, the phosphorus and the fluoride, we know that the fluoride is a definitely a lot more electronegative. So the dipole arrow goes from left to right in this scenario, okay? All the other ones, either they're ionic, there's no arrow involved, no dipole arrow, or they're uh, nonpolar and being nonpolar, they don't have a dipole, okay? We're almost done with this chapter and then we're gonna take a quick break, okay? All right, so here's the thing. <clears throat> when a molecule has all nonpolar bonds, then the molecule itself overall would be nonpolar. Okay. Straightforward. Nonpolar bonds, nonpolar. Um, for example, you, you might say the carbon hydrogen. Well, if you look at if you think about it, a lot of the vegetable oils, a lot of the fat, uh, they are carbon hydrogen bound. And, and because of that, and they are very nonpolar. I mean, they dissolve more in oil like products, right? Oil like solvents, I should say. Oil and water do not mix because uh, oil, vegetable oil, has a lot of carbon hydrogen bonds, which are nonpolar. And we're not dissolving water very well. If you have polar bonds, okay, if you have polar bonds that do not cancel out, we talked about this earlier, then you have a polar molecule. For example, here you have carbon, uh, sulfur, and oxygen. That's a polar bond, but it's in the direction going to, to down to the right. See that dipole arrow? The other one is doing the opposite direction, down and to the left, okay? They're going in separate directions. So as I mentioned, those arrows are vectors. And mathematically, we can add and subtract them graphically. But since they're going in opposite directions, they don't cancel each other out, OK? They're going in opposite and different directions, I should say. I should say. They don't cancel each other out. Therefore, um, they, have, uh, they are polar molecules. Here's another example of how the geometry plays a factor, which brings us to the shapes table in the tetrahedral, okay? Now, imagine, if you will, that we had um, 
Uh, let me let me draw something here. Imagine, if you will, that in this example, you had a chloride there, a chloride there, chloride there, and a chloride there, and this was carbon. Okay. So yes, it would all be tetrahedral after we did the geometry. And guess what? Yes, because you have a carbon hydrogen bond, you have a dipole going from every, you have four polar bonds, okay? From each carbon and chloride, four polar bonds. But based on the geometry of tetrahedral, when you have a tetrahedral, tetrahedral geometry and you got polar bonds, in this scenario, mathematically, those polar, four polar bonds cancel out. Therefore, if you had, uh, you were using in the example of, car oh, wrong one. if this were um, carbon tetrachloride, or chlorides bonded to the central carbon, which we would think because they have polar bonds, they would be polar, but because they're tetrahedral, all four polar bonds cancel out. We will have a nonpolar covalent bond molecule, NP, nonpolar. Okay. But here's another example where in, in the tetrahedral, the polar bonds cancel each other out. And therefore, you end up with a nonpolar species. Another example would be carbon dioxide. We went through the structure of carbon dioxide, and this is what we came up with, okay? And there is a polar bond. There's two polar bonds between the carbon and the oxygen, but they're going in complete opposite directions. One's going to the left, which is in the negative direction. One's going to the right in the positive direction. The result is those polar bonds do cancel out. So the net effect is you end up with a nonpolar molecule. Okay, nonpolar molecule, even though you have polar bonds. So you can have a scenario. Here's a, let me rehash the scenario. All nonpolar bonds, you end up with a nonpolar molecule. Fatty acids are a good example, you know, oils and vegetable oils, all nonpolar bonds, carbon hydrogen bonds. Or you can have polar bonds that do not cancel out because the bonds don't, are going in different directions due to the geometry, okay, of the molecule, due to the geometry that it has, the polar bonds do not cancel out, therefore you end up with a polar molecule. And the same token, due to the geometry, the polar bonds in the molecule do cancel out like carbon dioxide, therefore you end up with a nonpolar molecule. In fact, uh, carbon dioxide is very nonpolar. Yes, I know we make carb carbonated drinks, but they're not really, they're in solution, but not totally dissolved. Uh, if they were totally dissolved, you wouldn't be able to take a soda pop and shake it and get the bubbling to come out because <laughs> you're driving out the carbon dioxide. So in fact, a lot of gases are not very soluble. You can boil water and drive all the gases out of it. Okay. So th those are the three scenarios to determine whether a molecule is polar or nonpolar. And so, for example, we talked about, well, hydrocarbons, carbon, hydrogen, there's four bonds. We do the geometry, it becomes uh, tetrahedral. Carbon, hydrogen are four nonpolar bonds. Automatically, we end up with a nonpolar molecule. Okay, PCL3, if we do that structure, the Lewis dot structure, and you may want to do it so you can see for yourself. You end up with phosphorus, chloride, 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 and then you have all the valence electrons and you end up, guess what? Bam, a lone pair in the central atom, okay? And <laughs> if, the, if the, that lone pair did not take up more space, and everybody was equally distributed, then those three bonds like the tetrahedral would, would cancel out. But because that lone pair squishes the other bonds in, 
the dipoles of the phosphorus chloride bonds do not cancel out, and therefore you end up with a polar molecule. And that's because of the lone pair on the central atom. And that's what I said. When you end up with a lone pair in the central atom, okay, nine times out of 10, 99 times out of, out of 100, you end up with a polar molecule. And then carbon dioxide, as we talked about, two polar bonds, but they cancel each other out. So you end up with nonpolar molecules. All right. So something you may want to look at, you might want to take a look at that. Look at the water, look at ammonia. We did talk about them, but prime again, draw the Lewis dust structure, determine the shape, look at the bond angles. Determine if the bonds are polar or if the molecule, if, if the, determine if the bonds are polar and if the molecule is polar in the cell. Okay. So, with that being said, congratulations. We're done with chapter seven. And uh, tell you what, let's take a quick 10 minute break. I got 1045. Let's come back at 240, excuse me, 245. Let's come back at, at 255. Okay. All right. Let me pause. Let me stop. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm back. All right, guys. Um, let us continue. I'm going to jump into uh, chapter eight, which deals with nomenclature. Now, a quick word about the nomenclature. Remember that there is a nomenclature exam, which is basically uh, the, what the department requires that you get at least 80% to uh, get credit for it. Uh, right now, I've not, been, uh, no one's tried it yet, but you have unlimited trials, so go in there and you know I would I would just go in there and just take them a number of times to figure out where you're at. Now what they what it does, the way it works is they either give you a, a structure or they give you a name, and you come up if you got a structure, then give it the name. If you got a name, give it the structure. And there's 20, so if you get 80 percent above, then you got your points. Other than that, if you get anything less than 80, then I got to set that to zero. Now, people forget that it does have a large effect on your grade, especially even the border. So what I'm going to do after class today, I'm going to uh, set this uh, canvas. If you haven't attempted it, doesn't have a grade design incorporated into your overall grade. So the moment I put a zero on there is going to see show you the effect it has on, on your grade. So don't get freaked out too bad when you see it drop. Yeah, uh, if you're great, if you're on the border, because it will now, uh, Canvas will take into account those points and the percentage for that particular assignment. Okay. So, anyway, so we, this has to do with nomenclature, right? And naming. Now, I've been doing the naming as we progress, and we've been talking about it. So, but this time we're going to be more specific. Now, when we are talking about to say the neutral atoms, we just name them as is. So we got sodium is simply sodium atom. But we have to say the term, give the term atom if we're talking about the element, okay? Uh, because we know that the metals are going to lose electrons and then they become ions. Now we don't change the name of the metals as they become ions. All we do is add the term ion. So it would be sodium ion, for example, if this was, was a plus one ion. It is the nonmetals that we change the name. The nonmetals go from uh, sulfur become sulfide. And those are the type of names I've been introducing as we've been progressing here. So obviously N E is neon and so forth. So be familiar with the first 20, and then we're gonna add a couple more. We're going to add Ba, which is barium, Co, which is cobalt, I is iodine, Cu is will be copper, okay? Fe is iron, Pb is lead, 
HD is mercury, AG is silver, AU is gold, ZN is zinc, SN is stannous, uh, or um, pen. Uh, you're familiar with this. If you look at your toothpaste, look at their ingredients, you'll see stannous fluoride. And that's what you're brushing your teeth with. It may say tin fluoride, but you can use the term tan, T-I-N, or stannous, either way. Strontium for SR, nickel for NI, BR for bromine, uh, chrome for uh, CR, manganese, MN, and cadmium for CD. Okay. All right. <laughs> now, when it comes to ionic compounds, all right. So remember, ionic compounds, a combination of metal and nonmetal. Covalent compounds, strictly nonmetals, aka also known as molecular compounds. Right. So uh, we have monatomic ions, atoms with one charge. Now you have, or will, or should know, if not, you should know, the atomic charge of the ions for sixteen elements. Okay. 16. All right. For the metals, for everybody in group one, excluding hydrogen, that we're just talking about the metals right now. Being in group one, they all have one valence electron. When they become ionic, again, because they're metals and want to lose electrons, they're going to lose one electron. Okay. So, what I've highlighted there in group one from lithium on down, everybody there has a plus one charge. Okay. In in the ionic form. Everybody in group two will have a plus two charge, again, because they're metals, and second, they have two valence electrons. By losing those two valence electrons or one valence electrons, their octet, and the next layer in energy level is full with eight. Okay, that's their driving force. They become isoelectronic with the noble gas behind them. Now, so right there, you have one, two, three, four, five, 12 ions that you know their charge 100% of the time. And then I'm going to add three more. If you look at 8L aluminum, number 13, our circle, always has a plus three. A diagonal to that is zinc, number 30 always has a plus two. And then you got silver, which is diagonal to zinc, always has a plus one, and then make a right turn, go back to the right, for CD for cadmium, always has a plus two. So there's 16 ions that have a constant charge. Another term that you hear is oxidation number, okay? Either going to be a positive oxidation number or negative. Positive because they're metals. So those 16 always have a known charge. Okay. That means that the other metals will have a variable charge. And we have to designate those slightly different with respect to the name. And we use Roman numerals. For example, copper can either lose one electron or two electrons. So it could it could be either a plus one state or a plus two state, okay? And to distinguish between those two, copper one and copper two, which is true for all the other metals that are not highlighted in red, we have to use Roman numerals. And so um, copper, we could write as C, U, okay, or I'll just go ahead and type it out. We could designate it as copper one, Roman numeral one, or copper Roman numeral two, okay? The old nomenclature used to be cupric and cupress and so forth, and that could be very ambiguous. And so the format now is to use Roman numerals and there's no question whatsoever which one you're talking about. Two different types of uh, copper, totally different properties, even have totally different color. 
one has a very bright blue color and the other has like greenish tinge color to it, okay? And we designate the difference be, uh, using Roman numerals, Roman numeral one for copper one, Roman numeral two for copper uh, two. Iron is the same scenario. Iron can exist as either iron two, that be a plus two charge, or iron three, which would be a plus three charge, okay? When you are writing these Roman numerals, they are just showing you, depicting the charge of the metal. It has nothing to do with the anion. So we could use chloride, for example, iron two chloride, iron three chloride, okay? The same true, the same is true with copper. Copper one chloride, copper two chloride. The Roman numeral tells you what is the charge of the metal only, not on the anion part. Okay. So you know 16 of charge of the, the oxidation or the charge on 16 ions 100% of the time, which means those 16 do not require Roman numerals. And so if you were doing sodium chloride, you simply would say or write NaCl sodium chloride. You wouldn't have to write Roman numeral one. Why? Because those are constant charges. Everybody in group one is part of the 16. All right, so. Oh, okay. Now, the polyatomic ions, we, we kind of touch on those. They have their own specific name. Again, they are on the periodic table on the far left corner, okay? They have their own specific name, we don't change them. And so it, we use acetate or hydroxide or cyanide or whatever the polyatomic ion you're using. We are simply, their name is, that's what it is, don't change it, okay? So some people want, tend to take like NO3 nitrate, they wanna call it trioxide nitrogen. No, 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 it's just nitrate and it's just nitrite. And it's the same is true for sulfate and sulfite, et cetera, okay? All right. And, and uh, huh. all right, so um, oxidation state, Fancy name for the charge, okay? But it's commonly used. So when we talk about the oxidation state of an atom, we're talking about basically its charge, okay? That's how it is. Now, all the elements, as we talked about earlier, all the elements have an oxidation number of zero. Why? because they have an equal number of protons and an equal number of electrons, okay? Nothing's changed there as far as change of positive and negatives. Equal number, hence we have a net zero for all the elements, okay? It is the elements that either gain or lose electrons that we create the ions and that gives them the oxidation number or the charge, okay? I gave you the list of the 16. These have fixed charges. There's only one possibility for them to have. All the other elements, all the other metals have a variable charge, okay? Have a variable charge. And you'll be able to determine what that charge is. For example, let me do a couple examples, okay? Uh, let me draw a couple. Let's say, uh, you are using, uh, you drew, you were given this formula. Copper, two bromide, okay? And the question is, all right, copper is not part of the 16, so I don't know what its oxidation state is. But I do know what the oxidation state is for the bromide. Remember the bromide is one of the nonmetals that when it, it wants to gain one electron. And so it has a negative one charge. And so that means that two bromides means I got a negative two charge. Okay. 
So I can very quickly step out a very short algebraic e expression where copper minus two equals zero. What does that tell you? That copper must be a plus two. And sure enough, this will be copper two, Roman number two bromide. The same is true if I were to write, to have written uh, copper PR. Both of them have the name copper bromide, but they're totally different compounds. And to determine which one is which, I look at, in this case, the anion, because I know the charge on the anion. The bromides each have a negative one. Up here in the left, it, there's only one negative one. So when I add them together, they got to equal zero, right? That's why I wrote up here, Cu minus two equals zero. When I put them together to write the formula, I got to add enough positive and enough negatives so they equal zero. Up here, this suggests that I'm using copper one because the bromide itself is negative one. So I have copper one bromide in the far left corner and, the, and then on the right side, I have copper two bromide. And that's how we distinguish the two, okay? And so even though you, you always know the oxidation number, one of the ions in a compound to, the, to help you calculate what the other oxidation number is. Okay, so we know about the cations, okay? We at length talked about group one, group two, group three. We talked about zinc and cadmium and silver and aluminum, okay? So that gives you the 16, the 16 elements with a constant oxidation number, okay? That implies that the other metals can vary and they can go from a plus one all the way to a plus nine, meaning some can lose one electron, some can lose nine electrons, depending on the conditions, okay? And in that case, if they're not part of the 16 to help determine, be specific as far as which ion we're using, we use Roman numerals. So we talked about copper Roman number two. We talked about the iron, either in this state would be iron three and lead. Lead could be, uh, have lost four ion, four electrons, excuse me. So uh, lead four would be Roman numeral lead, Roman numeral four, okay? So remember the, the Roman numeral here deals with the oxidation state of the metal, not the ion, not the anion. All right, nine metals, we talked about this, uh, gain electrons, okay? So group five, they're gonna usually gain three. Give you a negative three charge. Group six, negative two. Group seven, uh, negative one, okay? And so group eight, obviously it's uh, the octet is fulfilled, the noble gases, nothing's gonna happen to them, okay? They're gonna be happy, <laughs> as they use the term happy. Uh, and uh, they're not going to pick up any more electrons. Very unreactive. All right. So ionic compounds, this is a metal and a non-metal combination. Now, the thing about the naming, the nomenclature, is we don't use prefixes. Notice that we earlier we talked about carbon dioxide, a carbon and two oxygens, or carbon monoxide. And so those are covalent compounds. Now, here's the thing to remember. When we work with ionic compounds with respect to the nomenclature or the naming, we don't use prefixes, okay? No prefixes. And when we deal with uh, covalent compounds, we use prefixes. And so let's say barium chloride, BaCl2, it would just be called barium chloride. It wouldn't be called barium dichloride, just barium chloride. But CO2 is carbon dioxide, right? Prefixes between in ionic and covalent compounds, but not in ionic compounds, okay? When we put them together with respect to ionic compounds, we have to put enough charges so that the sum equals the zero, okay? 
Now, I repeat with respect to the polyatomic ions in a product table, each have a charge. There's some of them have a negative one, some of them have a negative three charge for the anions. The cations only have a plus one charge. You got to remember that because you may use them to put formulas together, okay? And you got to put enough together so they cancel each other out with respect to their, their respective charges, okay? All right, so let's take, let's combine the sodium ion and the nitrogen ion, otherwise known as nitrite. We know that the sodium ion is in group one. Okay, so it would have a plus one charge. And we know that the nitrogen is in group five. So when nitrogen becomes ionic, it becomes an ion, it will pick up three electrons, okay? Three electrons giving it a negative three charge. Also the name changes from nitrogen to nitrite. I'll write that here in a second. So we need three sodium ions to cancel out the negative three of the, nit uh, the nitrite. And so its formula becomes Na subscript three. This is where now you can put in the subscript. And that right there tells you that I have three atoms of sodium ion per one atom of the nitrite ion, okay? So it's a three to one ratio there. Okay. Let's, let's take a look at this. All right, so before I forget, let me give it its name. And so nitrogen now changed the name. Sodium metal, the, the metals don't change the name. We'll keep it as sodium. But nitrogen went from nitrogen to nitride, okay? So the name for the Na3N is sodium nitride. Nitrite. And let me draw this here. And so I have a double arrow because a nomenclature exam would be something like this, where you're given the name and give the formula, or you got the formula, give it the name. Okay, let's combine uh, the sodium and the sulfur, in other words, as ionic compounds. Again, we know that sodium is a plus one. The sulfur is in group uh, six. So when it becomes ionic, it's gonna pick up two electrons. So now we have, we need two sodiums for every one sulfur ion, which now changed the name to sulfide. So this becomes sodium sulfide, okay? It came from the neutral atom, which was originally sulfur. And but once it became, the ion became sulfide. Now I'm using sodium here, but keep in mind, you can use all the cations. You can use lithium, potassium, magnesium, beryllium, all of the metals that we have. So you already have, access to, I would say, a couple, couple thousand compounds if you mix and match, okay? And so that is the formula for Na2S, and the name, I should say, sodium sulfide. Okay, the next example, we have magnesium and we have the oxide. Now, my recommendation, I should have done this to begin with, is when you have this type of a question, is before I put anything together, is I write write the um, the um, um, the ions first, okay? And so I know that magnesium magnesium is in group two, so magnesium will have a plus two charge. And I know that oxygen is in group six and it will pick up two electrons to give you a negative two, okay? So I write the ions first before I put them together. The same is true up here 
when, where I should have done sodium first and then the sulfur is a negative two. That tells me that I need two sodium and that two becomes a, the subscript for the sodium in the previous formula. All right, so I wrote the ions first, I got magnesium plus two and the oxygen, which is a negative two. And I can put them together now as a one to one. Why? Because the plus two will cancel out the negative two. And so let me clear this up real quick. My formula would be Mg. My name would be magnesium sulfide. Up here, I had sodium. Did I say sulfide? I meant oxide. And then the bottom one here would be magnesium oxide. Okay. Got a question? Yes, magnesium oxide. Correct. Yeah, I was I was thinking, I was looking at the sulfur and then I'm looking at the oxygen. All right, so I got that. I got the name, I got the formula. All right, let's work in the next one. What do we got here? All right, now we got potassium and we have the phosphorus. So again, my recommendation is write the ions first. And so I have potassium. And what I know about potassium, it is in group one. So it will have a plus two. Is that correct? No, of course not. As it has a plus one because it's in group one of one valence electron. All right, look look at phosphorus. Phosphorus in group five. It's right underneath nitrogen. Okay, exactly. Kathleen, phosphorus would have a negative three. Okay, it's in group five. Pick up three electrons. Okay. So that tells me that I need three potassium ions to cancel out the negative three of the phosphide. Notice the name now becomes from phosphorus as the element to phosphide as the ion. And so now I write the formula that, that three coefficient now becomes a subscript. So it's K subscript. Two, three, excuse me, T, with the name being potassium phosphide. Turn this out here. Oh, and pure my sodium. All right. Next one, I got calcium and the nitrogen. Okay, similar scenario. Write the ions first. Okay, calcium is in group two. So I got a plus two. Nitrogen is in group five. So the ion for nitrogen is negative three. Everybody agree? Okay, now the previous examples, they were pretty straightforward, right? Uh, I can just simply add three to one and just, or put them one to one together. But here I got, I got a plus two and a negative three. So I need to put them together in such a manner that the overall charge cancels out. Well, in order to do that, I must find a common factor. Very much like trying to add two fractions, like one-fifth plus one-sixth. I can't add them directly. I got to find a common factor for those two. Well, here I get the similar, an analogous situation. I got a plus two and a negative three. So I need to find a common factor. And my common factor, if you really think about it, is a six. And that means that if I have Three calcium ions with a positive two, 
I get an overall overall plus six charge. And if I have two of the negative three, I got an overall negative six charge. So my common factor fits there. So I need three calcium and two nitrogen. Okay. And sure enough, there it is. Okay, that's my formula. Notice a little a little kind of tidbit here is that the um, the the charge of the anion, which is negative three, is the coefficient for the cation. And the charge for the cation becomes a coefficient for the anion. So they kind of cross each other, right? To find that common factor. It's a good little trick to remember. You 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 could be using this, you know, down the road for other examples. Okay, so the name here now becomes uh, calcium nitride. Okay, and I lost my sodium again. Okay, we got a question. Calcium nitride, that is correct. Okay. God, I keep killing my, <laughs> keep killing my, uh, my sodium sulfide. Maybe I got to move further away. All right. Now notice here in the naming of all these. Okay. Let me put that. Sodium back up there. Notice what we got in common here. First of all, for the metals, sodium, magnesium, potassium, calcium, we didn't change the name, nor did we use the Roman numerals. Why? Because all the metals here belong to the sweet 16, group one, group two, and those other four that it gave you. Those are uh, the the only single oxidation state they have a known oxidation state that don't vary they're not variable and being th that they're not variable we don't need to put in the roman numeral number so by convention roman numerals are not used for the 16 okay it would be incorrect to use roman numerals all right it is only when we get out of the 16 metals that we start using Roman numeral. Okay. Ah, here's another one. We had aluminum. Okay. Aluminum, we know, is a plus three. And the chlorides each have a negative one. Okay. It's in group seven. Aluminum. Let me let me clear this up a little bit. Aluminum has a plus three. It's in group three. It's a metal. It's going to lose three electrons. And so here, uh, the chlorides have a negative one. It's in group seven. They have a negative negative uh, one. And so we're going to need three chlorides per every aluminum ion. Okay, and so our formula becomes AlCl3, and the name becomes aluminum chloride, not chlorine. But chloride. Notice the IDE extension on all of them: the sulfide, the oxide, the phosphide, the nitride, the chloride, the bromide, the iodide, that IDE tells you it's just the atom itself singly. Yeah, the oxide, the, the sulfide, for example, remember the polyatomic ions where we got the sulfate and the sulfite, A-T-E, I-T-E, those tell you those are the sulfur, but with oxygens bonded to it. So the IDE just tells you it's the single element. 
by itself, the single uh, non-metal by itself, not associated with anything else. All right, so got to care of that. Okay, then we got the zinc. We know that the zinc, write the ion first. Zinc is a plus two. The iodide, okay, is a negative one, just like the chloride was. So we can write the name, the write the formula with zinc, Z N, and then I subscript Q. Zinc iodide. Okay. Now we go go into the variable ones. What they're telling you here is copper Cu. But they got in, they, what they've done is put that in Roman numerals. So what that tells you is this, that you are using copper plus two. And the oxygen is a negative two. Why? Because it is in group six and it becomes ionic. It's a negative two, picks up two electrons. Okay, so copper Roman numeral two is a plus two, oxides a negative two, guess what? I can simply put them together on a one-to-one -one basis, okay? So now I got CuO. The name is important here, okay? To write the name out. It would be copper, Roman numeral two, because that's what you're given. That's the ion that you're reusing, oxide. Now you don't, I didn't put a space right after the R to separate the Roman numeral. You could pamp, you can put one if you want, but uh, uh, um, uh, Canvas is, is will check to see if you put a space after or, or not. It doesn't make a difference it, without a space or with the space. It's the same thing. Okay. So we got copper two oxide. Now keep in mind as we're going through all this, so we're writing. I'm writing the names down. And remember, you can you start thinking about, I got the name, give me the formula. I got the formula, give me the, the name, vice versa, okay? All right, so let's... Continue, let's do one more. All right, now we got PB, which is lead, and we got Roman numeral. Four. Okay, so that means you're dealing with PB plus four. Okay, and we know that the oxygen, like the previous example, has a negative two. Okay, so uh, we got a plus four and a negative two. Straightforward, we need two oxides to cancel out the positive four of lead. And so our formula becomes PbO2. The name be lead, Roman numeral four, oxide. But do, do, do put a space after the, between the two different words, between the lead and the oxide, yeah. All right, so that's lead four, Oxide. All right, let's see what else we got. I think we got one more. No, I guess not. All right, so thing to take away here is given, like I said, the formula to give you the elements, convert the elements into the ions. So you know how many of each you need to put together. We keep it in mind that I need to put enough positive and negatives together so they cancel out uh, to zero. And if the charges are different, like we had with respect to the calcium and the nitrite, then look for a common number. Okay, so that's why we had three calcium and two nitrite. Because the nitrite had a negative three and the calcium had a positive two. Okay, so look for a common factor. And then if you're not, the, uh, the metals that belong to the, the 16, when you're naming them, you don't have to put, don't put Roman numerals on them. So sodium is sodium, magnesium is magnesium. It is only those that are not 
part of the 16 that you use Roman numerals so you can distinguish which ion you're working with because those those others outside the 16 have a variable oxidation state, okay? So, you know, it, also think about this, even though we work through it, but, you know, you could be given simply the formula, okay? PbO2, and you're asked to give it, to give the name. Why you think about this, you're like, okay, well, lead is not part of the 16, so which oxidation state am I using? Well, what do you know? You know that oxygen, each one has a negative two. You got two of them. That means you got a total of negative four coming from the oxide, okay? That implies that you need a, the, the lead must be a plus four, okay? See how you can work it backwards? The same is true for copper, copper oxide. You can give in the formula, you know that you, oxygen oxide is a negative two, this implies that copper here must be a plus two, okay? So this is what I mean by you're always going to know what the charge is um, uh, of all of them. Now, I think uh, uh, I said everything equals to zero, but there are examples in the homework that the ions, you could be, you could be asked for the oxidation number of, let's say, um, Sulfate. So this is what I'm trying to say here. Is this the uh, total number cations plus total number of anions equal the charge of the molecule? Okay. That's what the reaction, the, 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 the um, equation should be. Oh, hold on. Ah. Okay. All right, because uh, and, and then this general equation applies for whether the compound or the molecule is neutral or not, okay? Neutral or not. For example, what if you were asked for the oxidation number of the sulfate, the sulfur in the sulfate ion, okay? And so you're given SO four minus two. Question is, what is the oxidation number of sulfur here? Well, guess what? You can use this equation. The cation would be the sulfur. The anion is the negative, right? And so you could say S minus eight, okay, equals minus two because minus eight is um, the charge for the each oxygen and solve for S and sulfur. Negative two is the overall charge of the molecule. Most of the time it's zero, but it, sometimes it isn't, right? And you can end up in some cases, like in the homework, there are some questions that you can end up with a quarter charge or something here, but. It's some, that was just more of an exercise. Most of the time, you're going to end up with a nice even number. Okay. So keep that in mind. Maybe that re that equation kind of fills a lot more uh, uh, conditions. Anyway, uh, it's about that time. Let me stop it here. Uh, stop the share.